So here we are at the gravesite of a name that might be familiar to some mm -hmm. people, talking about George Nixon of the 73rd Ohio, who was wounded not terribly far from where we're standing right now. Right. Um, yeah, tell us about him. Uh, Private George Nixon was 40 years old in November of 1861. So on the older side. When he decided that he wanted to enlist. Wow. He leaves behind a 35-year-old wife named Margaret and nine children. Wow. Um, I'm going to have to rely on notes for this one because I don't remember all nine names. <laughs> but just to give you an idea, he has a daughter named Martha, a son named David, another named Samuel, an, a daughter named Margaret, a daughter named Sarah, son William, son Boston, son Hiram, and so, son Elihu. They range in age from 17 down to the age of one. Mm. I've had people here say he probably enlisted in the army for some peace and quiet. Yeah, <laughs> sure, yeah. But he had a fairly hard scrabble life. George Nixon was a farmer, mm -hmm. stands only five foot six and a half inches tall, owns no property himself. Oh, wow. uh, according to the 1860 census, he owns, he had some livestock and some farm equipment, mm -hmm. but he apparently rented the land that he farmed. So it's not a a life that has given him a whole lot on, on which to build a family. Sure. He never explained why he decided to enlist. A private's pay of $13 a month is not going to go very far. Sure, yeah. And he enlists early in the war before there are bounties or anything like that that would enhance the pay. Mm -hmm. So for good or for ill, George Nixon has found himself in the Army. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps because of his age and the intensity of the soldier's experience, uh, he ended up on sick call an awful lot. Sure. Uh, he would end up developing rheumatism very badly. Uh, he had an inflammation of the eye mm. that kept him hospitalized for a while. He dislocated a bone in his hand at one point. Oh, no. Uh, there, were, he, there were a lot of things that he went through, but on this day, in this battle, uh, George Nixon is in the ranks. Mm -hmm. Now, we're up here on Cemetery Hill, and just in this direction from us, off to the west, runs the Emmitsburg Road. This is the, the space between us and the Emmitsburg Road and beyond where the Confederates happen to be. And one of the unappreciated elements of the Gettysburg fight is the fighting in that no man's land between Cemetery Hill and Seminary Ridge where the Confederates are. For those of you who are frequent visitors here, you might know such, thing, uh, such locations in town as the Gettysburg Recreation Park. We always call it the Rec Park. You might know of familiar uh, places to go and and visit such as Tommy's Pizza or the Appalachian Brewing Company. Think about that ground and especially farther west, farther towards Seminary Ridge. And that's where the 73rd Ohio Infantry is going to spend most of its time. It's not involved in Little Round Top or in Pickett's Charge. It's literally fighting an extended skirmish line, the longest firefights of, of the entire battle. Out it in it this, goes on essentially all, all day. All day on the uh, most of the second and most of the third. Yeah. On the evening of the second, Private Nixon is forward is deployed forward, and he will get hit by two bullets. One will hit him in the right hip. One will hit him in the right side. Uh, he fell down in what has been described as a field of wheat, and he was screaming for help. Mm -hmm. It was the wounds were very painful. Uh, one of his company mates in Company B, in fact, it's musician, a drummer, 20-year-old mm -hmm. man by the name of Richard Enderlin, a recent immigrant from Switzerland, simply could not take it anymore. One mm -hmm. of the jobs of a musician in during battle, as you know, is to, of course, go out and provide all aid and support to the wounded as you could, but usually not right under the fire of the enemy. Right. And musician Enderlin is going to rush out into the open field and drag Private Nixon back to the safety of the Union lines. Mm -hmm. um, the Medal of Honor has just been authorized by the federal government, and for his act of selfless service here, a musician Richard Enderlin will be, become a recipient of the mm -hmm. Medal of Honor. Wow. Well, Private Nixon is going to end up down at the George Spangler farm. Right, right. And they're going to try to all they can to take care of the two wounds. They did not amputate. It, mm -hmm. Those weren't those kinds of wounds. They used usually what they called simply water dressings. Right. Where they just simply took rags that probably have already been used on another soldier and probably were boiled in a large pot of water, mm -hmm. we hope. Yes. And, and usually they just kept the wound wet. If they had some kind of a salve to put on it, they would use that. But um, 
there's an awful lot of wounded soldiers going on. Mm -hmm. On the 10th of July, Private Nixon passed away. Mm -hmm. He would be buried down on the George Spangler farm, and in time, um, his, re his remains would be brought up here. You have to think about poor Margaret back at home, mm. all those kids. Yeah. And for her, th this just is not going to stop. George Nixon dies on the, third of uh, on the 10th of July. On the 3rd of July, George Nixon's father, Margaret's father-in-law, mm -hmm. also passed away. Oh, wow. And in August, their son William also passes away. Several deaths right in a row. Margaret herself is going to apply for a widow's pension and, and get it, but the burden is too much to bear. And in 1865, she will pass away before her 40th, before her, um, 40th birthday. The Nixon children, will have to be separated and farmed out to various other family members. The family unit is essentially destroyed by the bullets that hit George Nixon here, here at Gettysburg. Now, the name Nixon, of course, rings a bell with us because George Nixon is the great-grandfather of future President Richard Nixon. And when he is vice president, he will come here. And there is a photograph of, of Richard Nixon standing here, looking down at the gravestone, bringing some flowers to the grave and all mm -hmm. that. We know that he is descended from uh, the, the, the second son and the third child, Samuel. Gotcha. Um, Samuel was, um, was uh, Richard Nixon's grandfather, and that's how the family connection uh, happens to be. I mean, when, if you think about it, here in the cemetery, it sort of seems like all of American history just surrounds us here. Absolutely. If, if we're in the next section over in the Massachusetts section, up near the front, there, there's a lieutenant by the name of um, Payne, uh, Lieutenant Sumner Payne. If you look back in his history, his great-grandfather was Robert Treat Payne, mm -hmm. one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence from wow. Massachusetts. Wow. So you can go from a signer of the Declaration of Independence, literally about as far away as I can throw a stone, down here to George Nixon, who is the great-grandfather of somebody who was certainly alive in my time, maybe not yours or, 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 or others here, but for an awful lot of us out there, this brings a full circle for us. Absolutely. All of American history is on this hillside. Well, and it's a great point too, because often I think it's easy for the Civil War to feel like ancient history, mm -hmm. um, but 160 years is, I mean, make no mistake, it's, it's a while, but it's not an eternity away. Um, and I think that connection that you just made really brings that point home. We do have a long and interesting and intertwined history. Yes. When we talk about you know, diversity as a plus, it certainly is, but the common bonds that tie us are also important as well. Mm -hmm. And like I say, here on this hillside and here on this battlefield where we can find soldiers who are named Antonio Lopez as well as John Smith, mm -hmm. there are lots of stories here. There's a lot of America right here. Absolutely.